Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle, medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Hey everybody, this is the Dr. Dads coming at you with another great episode, and I'm with my partner in crime, my main man, Dr. Nicholas Jensen. How are you, brother? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, doing doing really well. I mean, it's we actually just had our Canadian election, and uh, nothing changed. So <laughs> there's nothing really exciting to report on. It's just right? we're in it's the like, same wah, spot wah, we were, wah. you know, the day before. So. Right. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. uh, things are good. I think that's something everybody's hoping for right now is some change from what the status quo has been as of late, but uh, hopefully that's coming and as we create something better here in the future, right? Definitely. Well, I think it's an interesting theme because we're going to be talking about pain today and there's different types of pain. Obviously, there's, there's pain of things always being the same and, and, and wanting that pain to go away and, and have something shift. But uh, yeah, why, why don't you dive into a little bit of the sort of preamble uh, around our guest. Well, I'm speaking about creation. This guy is quite the creator and he's taken quite the journey to help people deal with this pain, right? So we have a, a really great guest on today. His name is Sam Visnick. And I'm going to just give a quick little bit about Sam real quick before we get started and we start chatting with him. So Sam has spent his life studying the fundamental aspects of human health with a focus on movement and clinical massage therapy. So in a world of specialists, surgical procedures, drugs, and quick fix remedies, there's plenty of those these days, right? He's committed to finding and developing strategies that help people stuck at the gap. So he's studied dozens of systems and methodologies for uncovering root cause of aches and pains, along with postural and movement issues, pain science, the art of science, and hands-on soft tissue massage techniques, myofascial release, uh, coaching movement is essential in his practice. So using these integrative, you know, different methods, but of all deciphering when to use them with different people and situations, and along with integration of movements that people want to be able to do again is a key to long-term success with his incredible track record with his clients. So understanding the various elements that contribute to conditions and the power of communication and education makes his release muscle therapy program unique from other hands-on therapy approaches. Now, Sam, thank you so much for joining us, brother. And thank you so much for having me. And first of all, I have to say congratulations on making it through that one heck of a long bio there. So <laughs> you <laughs> no, did really no. well. I really wanted to say everything because your bio speaks a lot to what I'm all about, man. I, awesome. I have had a very similar journey to you. You know, I went to school and I'm a chiropractor, but from going from a very unidimensional idea of what chiropractic was all about, I've kind of evolved and gotten to a very different place with a very similar journey of, you know, working through different methods and methodologies and, and finding truth in healing for people and helping them, like you're saying, get along to help them with their pain when they get stuck in these gaps. So I'm really excited to talk with you today, man. We both are. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it here too. Let's, let's get after it. So Sam, I'd really like to start you, you've had quite the journey, and I'm sure when you were in school from like, like then to now, there's a lot that has gone on that has kind of helped you evolve where you're at to take a different approach with your clients. So can you can kind of talk a little bit and give us a Cliff Notes version of like where that foundation started for you, and then what, what were those truths that helped to move you along to look for more of that truth, and, and what, what you know, sparked that curiosity to find that the more, right? Yeah, I would say that I I'm, I'm fairly lucky in the way that I had started this work and how I've gotten to where I am now. Um, when I graduated high school, uh, my first job was essentially uh, becoming a personal trainer. I was a classic skinny kid in high school, the one who needed to put weight on. And I was constantly in bookstores reading about bodybuilding and so forth. And, and I had obviously leaned toward the books that were more scientific and based. I didn't like loose programming. I'd always look at like Dr. Fred Hatfield, who was a, a well-known power lifter. And you look at his books and every little thing was mapped out. So I really like that kind of, this is exactly what you do, how, mon how much to do, et cetera. So when I got to becoming a personal trainer, I kind of took that approach to working with people. And this was right at, at about 99, 2000, where that functional training revolution started. You know, you go to the gym and everybody is, you know, rolling around on Swiss balls. People are starting to get away from machine training. They're starting to do balance exercises. 
And uh, kind of the, the, the movement that spearheaded this a lot was a couple of kind of main figures in the fitness arena. In the personal training field, it was the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So NASM and another guy that not a lot of people know about now, his name was Paul Check. And he was a neuromuscular massage therapist, and uh, he was a, a, a trainer for the Army boxing team. So when I had gone and started working at these uh, big chain uh, fitness centers, you know, you're, you're stuck right away with starting to work with people. And like, I want people to lift heavy and I want them to get muscle and so forth and lose body fat. But you realize that 99% of these people have all sorts of problems. You know, they have knee pain, they have back pain. And that wasn't really what I had expected, you know? So what I had to do a lot of times was do program and exercise modifications and become creative with working around these types of problems. But what ended up happening is, is that a lot of people got better as a result of what I was doing. I wasn't intending to fix their problems, but a lot of times it's like this person had knee pain when they squatted. So I would give them some, you know, I'd say, let's strengthen your hamstrings a little bit more. Or we'll focus on these other areas uh, if you can't do these exercises. And then I would end up getting them squatting eventually. And then their knee problem would go away and they'd say, hey, you know, I'd been to doctors and physical therapists and you got my knee better. So as I kept learning and I was just devouring books on not so much strength training, I was definitely into that at the time for my own stuff but a lot on physical therapy books. You know, every time I had a problem with a shoulder, I said, well, what is a rotator cuff tear? What is a, you know, an impingement syndrome? And I would go read as much as I could. And I would look at the exercise variations that were used. And so I was introduced to this concept very early on. As I started looking at the references in the books, I started studying the authors. I came upon Paul Check, and Paul Check was offering at the time the absolute most expensive course that you could take on, on personal training. I remember my first training course was about 400 bucks from the ISSA, and that was a lot back then. And Paul's courses were about two to $3,000 per level. And I had taken these and we went in and Paul was teaching us. I remember the first one was like orthopedic rehabilitation for back syndromes. And I was like, wow, okay, this is the first thing to step into. Um, but what Paul was really teaching was like, there's a lot of people out there who are outside of the therapeutic realm. You know, they had basically seen their doctor, they went to PT and they were stable, but they weren't at a point where they can go and exercise and do whatever they wanted. So I found that that was that gap that was exactly where I wanted to interject myself into. And so for quite a while after that, there was just a lot of emphasis on the structural biomechanics and movement aspects of, of the work that I was doing. And, um, you know, he, people had told me, you're not going to get good at this work until you start getting a license to do hands-on therapy. So I wasn't going to go back and do physical therapy or Cairo. I would have, but I was already kind of in the mix with what I wanted to do. So I decided that massage therapy was probably the easiest path for me. And uh, as I started school, that was kind of like where I started getting exposed to a lot of stuff now that, you know, we, we roll our eyes to. Um, but I went to neuromuscular therapy uh, courses at the same time. So while I was in massage school, I was doing all of this other stuff with people and doing the manual therapy. And I had started developing a pretty strong reputation for helping people when they had failed with a lot of different therapies. You know, so at that point, you know, as with any practitioner who's been paying attention and working on helping people, you would get stuck because not everybody's problem is a biomechanical structural problem. You're giving them all the right exercises, you're doing all the right stuff, but there's other things that are happening. You know, people aren't sleeping well, their, their nutrition is poor, right? They don't recover. And so I got introduced on that to uh, functional medicine or functional nutrition at the time, you know, people were talking about adrenal fatigue and stuff like that. And uh, I did a lot of internships with colleagues on that. Anybody that I could find that was running labs, I ran adrenal tests, urine profiles for years on people, looking at all of that stuff, using supplements. Um, I got really heavy into things like metabolic typing, which is to try to figure out what kind of diet works for a different type of um, genetic profile that somebody might have. And I linked up with a guy named Dr. Eric Serrano, who's a medical doctor. And uh, he taught me how to look at labs, how to identify underlying inflammatory issues, and uh, I went out and worked with him in Ohio for about a year and a half. And it was one of the few, th few things that you never get to be able to do. Most people in the industry is to go work with a doctor and, and literally kind of go room to room with him and watch him work with people. So I learned a lot with that. And, and I'd say that probably one of the most, the biggest learning lessons I had there was just the profound impact this doctor in particular had with his patients. They loved him. They drove everywhere, uh, all over the, the state sometimes to come and see him. He had profound rapport with people. And I really think that uh, some of the incredible changes he had with him is just because of how much he cared with people. So to me, that kind of led me into this direction of understanding a lot more 
about um, you know the the practitioner or the what we call the therapeutic alliance now is the rapport, the relationship between the therapist or the healthcare practitioner and the and the individual, and how that affects uh, and improves outcomes. Uh, last part of this, which I know you're asking for the cliff notes, but I think this is all important to the question you asked. Over years of studying different types of things, early on in my career, I had studied a lot of neurolinguistic programming to for communication purposes, uh, hypnotherapy, which I had been doing for a long time. Uh, that kind of led me into a lot of understandings of things that were working with my clients, like educating them, uh, working on things like improving relaxation and so forth, and wondering why these things were working so well and nobody was talking about it. And to some degree they were, but it wasn't more in the scientific literature until I came across uh, pain neuroscience education. And that was a big leap in my education. I uh, discovered that about 10 years ago, which was the concept of basically teaching people about pain and how that improves their, uh, their outcomes within uh, the therapy that they're doing. So up to this point, fast forward to 2020, I've kind of melded in all of those different approaches uh, into my, my work, which is now release muscle therapy. And, um, you know, we take a, a super individualized approach and in looking at all of the different factors that, that uh, contribute uh, to this chronic pain problem that an individual might have. And then we have to essentially kind of untangle that to figure out individually what they need. What a journey, man. I mean, it's so nice to hear how you've been able to pull from mentorship in these different fields and, and, you know, find your own way forward to help people in a more specific individualized kind of way, because that's, I mean, isn't that what's missing, right? I mean, how many members of our clinics are, or that come to see us are on a certain medication or they, they saw the specialist for, for pain and, and they're being managed by, you know, sort of one Avenue without looking at the whole picture and that's just that's just an unfortunate reality of of conventional medicine is that we're always looking for the thing that's going to get rid of the symptom. So um, on the on this journey, obviously you've got you've developed a really unique way to help people uh, with their pain. And I mean, you know, in your in your mind, what's what does an assessment look like? Like, how do you start to define where someone needs to spend spend a little more attention? Like, maybe they need more like that vagal nerve reset, or maybe they need a little bit more hands on. How do you help people uh, to identify that within themselves? Well, what I looked at is in this biopsychosocial model here is, again, understanding all of the different factors that affect the pain experience. And really, in my mind, I kind of sorted out based on uh, the idea that each individual has a unique pain experience. So not only do we have the information that's coming from the body that's going to the brain, but we have the brain's interpretation of what's happening. And the brain's interpretation has many different areas of the brain that is interpreting and filtering this information. And this is one of the ideas, for example, why uh, Mark Jensen out of University of Washington talks about how hypnosis can affect different parts of the brain. Because not only do we have that information that's coming from the body, let's say that, that you know, uh, I would say this industry jargon term nociception, right? So we have that information that's going to the brain. The brain has to, number one, interpret the quality of that information. What is it? Is it burning? Is it, um, you know, aching? Whatever we want to call it, right? And that's not exactly how it's interpreted, but that's the idea. And then it kicks it over to a, another part of the brain. The brain has a memory filter, you know, and that memory filter notices whether or not it has felt the sensation before. Then another part of the brain attributes a meaning to that. And then we have the other part of the brain, you know, we may have conscious awareness of what that means too. And all of these things are playing in together. So we have this, this primary thing of just information that's going to the brain, but then we have all of this other stuff that's going on that has to interpret that information. And that determines how much threat we have, and that's going to determine the amount of pain we have. So when I sit down with somebody there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that really have to tune in and listen to what somebody is telling you. And I ask them for certain things. So, you know, as you can imagine, you sit down with people and sometimes they go, I go, what's the quality of the pain? And they go, I don't know. It doesn't hurt. And then you say, well, it doesn't hurt, but they say, but I feel it. Well, what does feeling it mean? So I can almost get an idea that they're saying, well, I don't have pain, but then in a way they describe it as pain. So I'm getting the, the idea that this person is not being able to connect with what exactly is happening with them. And in that person, I might serve to try to work into a direction where I can sharpen that so they can help explain it to me. Um, a lot of times we operate under this assumption that, um, 
that basically we're all talking about the same thing. And most of the time we're not. I, don't, I really don't understand that person's experience from a generalization because they tell me that they have pain. I don't know what that means. I have to understand what that pain is from their own description and their own experience and what triggers it. And when I understand that, you know, is it a movement thing? Is it a, um, do you just wake up with it? Is it, you know, when you feel emotionally stressed, you feel it? What are all these factors that kind of play into that experience? And that can help me guide into kind of what direction I go. Now, regardless of, you know, any of those things, I'm always going to look at lifestyle factors. You know, I'm going to look at the things that I know in the research are, you know, the top priorities when it comes to knowing what increases nerve sensitivity. I'm also going to do a structural evaluation as well. I'm going to move people around. I'm going to find out if there's movements that they're threatened by. And if they do certain things, it makes them hurt or it, it makes them hurt even thinking about those things, which is a good area that we can talk about because that's always fun. And also, um, you know, in particular, how responsive are they to doing things? You know, so give them exercises, give them movements and kind of see what happens in real time when they do that as well. Well, it's funny, you know, me and Nick, we're big on multi-therapeutic approaches, right? And we always, it's all, like we're saying, it's all about taking this functional approach. Every person who walks through the door is very different. And you've accumulated all this knowledge and you've had just this nice tool bag, right? And we just like have people walk in, and, you know, the assessments is huge. And then you have to put these tools to work. And it's a lot of fun, right? And I'd imagine on your journey, you've actually expanded your knowledge on what tools I need, or I, I don't have a tool for that yet. So I got to go learn more because... There's something else that I'm missing, right? And that's that's the fun part about what we do, right? I mean, that's on my journey. That's kind of what's helped me keep evolving the process of how I approach everybody. It's like, okay, there's something going on here. I don't know enough about it. I need to go find more truth in this, right? Um, so let's take, let's go past this assessment. So somebody comes in, you use these things, you kind of determine. So in your book, you talk a little bit about energy, and I'd really like to talk how that plays into some of these things that you're doing these days and how you take an approach from an energy standpoint when you're looking at just like the energy systems of the body and taking more of this holistic approach and yeah. using that as like a foundation with like your paradigm. Um, are you talking about more like energy in terms of like metabolic issues? No, more of like the energy systems of the body. So like we're, we're talking about the nervous system, but how that plays into people's pain and why they're experiencing pain or a loss of structural integrity, or like you're saying, even from a metabolic standpoint, how that's affecting everything from like, oh, I have a crappy diet. So just from that holistic standpoint, I'm sure you see a lot of people where this is the case and you're having to work on all these things because the body can't heal if there's not enough energy being produced as a whole, right? Yeah. And that always is uh, my wife. I'll, I'll throw this in there. My wife is a, is a clinical nutritionist with an expertise in gastrointestinal problems, in particular, uh, SIBO, IBS, et cetera. So, you know, with her, we, we've had so many discussions over this idea of like, for example, that energy itself, whenever I hear that, my mind immediately goes into that, that uh, constant, I would say, general complaint that most of us oftentimes experience in saying, I don't, I have low energy. Uh, but always when we run the laboratory tests, what do we normally see? Everything is generally functioning fine. You know, so uh, mitochondria are working, energy is actually being produced, but that's not what we're feeling. Um, and so we always have to try to figure out where that is coming from and how that that's just as complicated as uh, trying to understand someone's pain. So under what circumstances and how do you experience having low energy? And I think that, um, you know, we can launch into a larger discussion of people generally being overwhelmed and having too much stuff going on in their lives. And they're just kind of like basically running out of the, the, the essential juice, whether that means neurotransmitters or whatever, uh, to be able to constantly fend off all of these different stressors. And we're constantly being pushed to the max to deal with these things. And uh, in traditional, it's at primitive times, we didn't have to persist like that. You know, we had temporary stressors that we had to deal with, and then we had a recovery time. But we're now seeing uh, the results of living in this kind of modern society and dealing with all of the different problems that we have, uh, structural, mechanical, and even the structural mechanical things. I think that, you know, we do less. So we actually do feel like we have less kinds of mechanical stress probably than previously, because, you know, in primitive times, we're a lot more active, but those things are now being exacerbated or the effects of it because of the problems everywhere else, poor nutrition, um, access to, I mean, um, being exposed to toxic elements in our environment. And this is really call it kind of causing this 
soup of things that are going on that our bodies are just overwhelmed with, and we're really having a hard time coping. So all of this is kind of going into the same thing. And, you know, we used to talk about this in terms of adrenal fatigue, for example, but it extends far beyond that. Um, our ability to cope with and adapt to stress is really being pushed to its limits. And, you know, we're not able to do that. So our body has to actually retreat. It has to kind of shut down a little bit and lower our energy levels because we cannot maintain that output. And when that happens, I think that when we start to push forward against that, and we're not listening to the messages that our body is giving us, then we're going to get threat and we're going to get pain. We're going to get all sorts of physiological symptoms. And the amazing thing to me is, is that it doesn't always manifest in pain. There are a lot of people with lots of different physiological problems that they don't have pain with. So it's just outputting in a different way, probably depending on the circumstances, the genetics, et cetera. You know, one yeah. of the things I'm, oh, go ahead, Nick, I'm sorry. No, no, you finish your thought and then I'll, I'll jump in. Well, no, as I'm hearing you talking, you know, one of the things I talk to my, my practice members all the time is vital function demands of the body, right? Like something as simple, like you're saying, is like you digesting well, you know, how's your energy every day as a whole? Like, what do you wake up with? Or how's your sleep? Like these basic things your body's got to be able to do just naturally every day and where you're at on that. And to speak to what you're saying is so many people are running uphill with these things and then, yeah, like for some people, th that's going to lead to some sort of pain experience, right? And then other people, you're going to see just that these vital function demands are breaking down. So, you know, foundationally, we focus on things like communication, right? The nervous system. And we, then we get into resources and we go into, you know, how well is your body having any kind of reactivity from an immune standpoint? And then where's the response and things like that. And I'm sure you kind of use a very similar type of paradigm when you're approaching each of these people to go in and try to address where these root causes are. Yeah. And these stressors, I always like to think about, like if we have an individual pain problem, um, let's say, you know, low back issue or SI joint or whatever it is, um, we get into this kind of like concept, whereas the person may be stressed overall, but they also have stresses that are compartmentalized in the way that they deal things. And that's the interesting part to me as well. Uh, so for example, from a th therapeutic perspective, if somebody is generally overwhelmed and, you know, we, we oftentimes see people who will sit down and they're just so uncomfortable and so stressed that they even have a hard time sitting still in their chair, you know, a global approach might be necessary because the whole system is overwhelmed and you could use meditation techniques or whatever it is to just calm the whole system down and their localized problem and their low back will improve to some degree. But also there, uh, I had also noted last year, what was probably one of the more stressful times globally because of COVID, but yet um, I didn't really fail to help people get better from their aches and pains because I was able to, from, a, from that smaller container or compartmentalized uh, pain where that person had a specific neurotag or, or uh, you know, I, I think a neurotag, I'm using words that I, I need to define here, but a pain experience that was more related that's in a container relative to the whole. So for that person, you know, reducing overall stress wasn't necessarily the thing that made them better. It was re releasing the stress that was associated to that problem individually that was the issue. So I think that part of our work is also, which is complicated, is being able to know and operate in this range of specificity to, to global and to understand at what level this problem actually exists in. To some degree, the whole always affects the local or that smaller area. But, you know, somewhere in there is where we have to be able to, uh, to work on and work the person to, to get the optimal effect based upon that individual situation. Yeah, I just want to add in a, a little maybe clarification for people listening, because I think often when we think of pain, we think pain exists in a musculoskeletal system. And so many people, you know, you mentioned your wife, we're helping people with SIBO and some other things. Um, can you speak to some of the visceral basically for those listening visceral meaning like the organ tissues to body uh complications that 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 you also help people with and often it can go the other way too so maybe the hip problem is 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 you know manifesting as a result of some other structural imbalance so how can you help people sort of appreciate just the different types of pain and and how they can kind of show up like that yeah. And I think that there are three different general classifications of pain that, that people should know about, right? And 
But all of it uh, from a starting standpoint of understanding uh, pain neuroscience is, is that we actually don't have pain nerves or pain receptors actually in the tissue. What we have is information. So these receptors send neutral information up the spinal cord to the brain. And that information is based upon you know, virtually anything you can feel. You can feel lack of blood flow. If you sit for too long, your butt aches, right? Uh, you can feel burning sensation. You can feel pressure. You can feel like any of these things. We have receptors for temperature changes. That information goes to the brain and the brain has to interpret it, right? So that information, when we have potentially threatening information is called nociception. We oftentimes associate that to the usual aches and pains that we have. Um, so that can produce the kind of casual uh, back pain or hip pain or anything else that we feel that usually is responsible, uh, responsive to things like movement, massage, chiropractic, et cetera. Um, but then we also have different types of pain, like, uh, you know, we have um, neurogenic type of pain, okay, which is, we generally associate to things like, for example, sciatica, carpal tunnel, and this is where there is actually like a damage or, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like saying damage, but a, a stress on the nerves themselves that causes that information to go to the brain that is kind of faulty, right? Sometimes, sometimes there's nerve compression and that's a real stress. And sometimes there's not, we've seen people with sciatic pain and there's nothing actually irritating the sciatic nerve. Um, and then we have this whole another category, which is kind of like the thing that everybody talks about and now, um, but has a hard time dealing with where it's kind of like the frontier, the new frontier we're all dealing with is nosoplastic pain and nosoplastic pain is very similar to what we call centralized pain. Um, and it's familiar with syndromes like, for example, fibromyalgia, which is like widespread pain or, uh, you know, I think more like, um, where's another complex regional pain syndrome. And the idea here is that the central portion of the nervous system is misinterpreting information that's coming in from the body, right? So when we get to through these different phases, it, it changes how we look at the pain that the person has and how we might deal with it, right? So when we have syndromes that kind of are progressive along that lines, like for example, we have that more neuro pain or that nosoplastic pain, in particular, that nosoplastic pain is very re reactive and responsive to things like gut inflammation and so forth. And the reason why is because the nervous system itself is the problem. It is not the tissue itself, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when we get into gut imbalances and so forth, this is where it starts to get real interesting is to say when somebody has small intestinal bowel overgrowth, uh, bacterial issues, um, if they have, um, I don't know, what else would we call it? Any kind of autoimmune-based conditions, these things, when they spike and those inflammatory situations ramp up, that person could have unpredictable responses in their body in terms of where they have pain. They may have an area where there's a small amount of nociception going on, right? But now it's like times 10. And, you know, when, a, when anybody, a health professional looks at their x-rays, looks at their MRIs, there's really nothing there. But that person is responding saying, I have a lot of pain. This hip is bothering me. This back is really just bothering me. And there doesn't appear to be anything there. So when we look at these different types of pain, we oftentimes are very quick to want to classify somebody as having one of those pains. Um, but the problem is, is that it doesn't really work like that. Uh, what oftentimes happen is if you think about a pie chart, that people will have like a percentage of each of those as inputting to their problem, depending on the chronicity of the problem, how long they've had it and what is really going on in the system. So it is, it is quite complex. Hey, I, I want you to just highlight this a little bit more because you, you hit on something I think is really important for people. And that's that there doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to be tissue pathology for this recurring, you know, plasticity that's happening in the nervous system. So the nervous system's irritated. Can you just describe that a little bit more detail? Because I, I think for so many people, especially the ones that we see, that's just so common. And, and they're looking for that, that pain relief, but they're not fully making that connection to that, that chronic irritation in the nervous system. Exactly. And this happens a lot. And there's been studies on this. And, and I, I, I need to have the one on hand that talk about, you know, uh, an MRI study that we took 100 people off the street, ran an MRI on their low back, and they found that approximately 60% of people had at least some kind of abnormality, meaning, you know, something small disc bulge, or maybe some arthritis or whatever. But then, you know, at a 60% of that, how many of those people actually had pain? I say very little. So the idea here that we keep going with as research continues and running uh, scans, visual diagnostics on people who don't have pain is that most people have these things. Mm 
So the issue is, is that these things tend to be just a coincidence a lot of times that when somebody has pain, they go in, they have a scan. Oh, that must be the reason why you have pain. And, and that's oftentimes not the case. And by the time people get to practitioners who are in the gap and they've already been through the medical system, this is, you know, I always tell my clients, I say, well, these people can help me. I'm like, they're not incompetent. It's just the problem is, is that, you know, from that kind of diagnostic and treatment model, you could see that maybe your issue had nothing to do with what they found on the scan. Okay. So in the research, we know that for sure is that there's no way to predictably look at an MRI or an X-ray and predict who has pain. You know, there's no way to know that because the diagnostics, the visuals do not tell everything. I always remind people, there's a reason why you don't go to the doctor. And every time we go in there, they run a full body scan because they're going to find lots of stuff in there that has nothing to do with why you're there. And they may be coincidental and things that come and go. So what I'm trying to teach people with pain neuroscience education and the concept of this is, is that pain is, is an interpretation of what is happening. It is not always the thing that is happening. Uh, so we've all seen those stories on CNN.com where the construction worker walks in and they, sh they show the x-ray and there's like a nail that's like three inches in his head. I think the one story I, rem I remember that the guy ended up going in there because he had a headache. And they ended up running an x-ray on him and he had a nail in his head and Ugh. he didn't remember it. He didn't even know it was there. He was just, you know, oh, I was having some headaches recently or lately. And he had a nail in his head. I so tissue that. damage was clearly present and yet he had a minor headache. Um, and so there was that classic story that was taught, you know, uh, it always ends up being a construction worker because they end up shooting nails through their foots and stuff. But the guy came in, he was writhing in pain, you know, um, he was on a gurney, hospital staff couldn't hold him down. He had shot a nail through his, his boot into his foot and they had to knock the guy out. And then they ended up having to saw the boot off. And when they took the boot off, they found that the, the nail didn't go through the foot. It went between his toes. So it didn't even have any tissue damage, but yet there's this individual with this perception of immense threat happening, and he was having a tremendous amount of pain. So that's the interesting thing about pain is that pain is, is uh, taking information and then making a decision on whether or not we experience threat. It may or may not be associated to any tissue pathology at all. You, you nailed it. Speaking of nails, <laughs> <laughs> I like that's, the nails. It's a, dad, it's a dad joke, um, oh, man. Good. That's that's so important. Thank you for just really reiterating that interpretation piece. And you know, I know people listening, like including myself, you know, on different little things that are that nag, that nag us. I mean, how can we? How can you help us understand how we can interpret it, uh, interpret things uh, a little bit more effectively? Like let's say for us as listener, listeners, and then obviously no. Uh, who would be the right fit or what would be the right therapy or when's the massage appropriate, but help, help us and help our listeners really, you know, where's some steps they can take to help with that interpretation. Like other than let's say the guy take his, take a shoe off, you would have realized that <laughs> the nail wasn't there, yeah. but anyways, uh, please take it away. I think that there's some of this that's kind of like we know as parents, uh, I'm a parent of two little ones um, that we were taught, you know, as a, as a parent, like your, your children, oftentimes when they take falls and so forth, they don't always respond until they see our response. And so that, you know, if they fall and we go like this, they, they start crying because they looked at me and then they thought something must be bad, but sometimes they fall and I'm like, you're okay. And they, look up and they look a little confused and they run off and they have scrapes on their knees, you know? So um, we look very much to our surroundings, our environment to, to try to interpret things um, as well. So sometimes we have to be aware from the kind of a metacognition from a stepping back and thinking about what's happening, what the circumstances are. Uh, am I really a threat or is this just a perceived threat? Uh, things like that. But, you know, we run into this kind of sticky area too, which is uh, when to pay attention to pain and when to ignore pain. And that is something I'm, I'm very adamant about with my clients and understanding there is a world of difference between acute pain based on an injury, based on you look down and you, you know, if you roll an ankle and your, your ankle is like a softball, there is a reason there's tissue damage there. You need to go have that evaluated. And this is the role of looking and working with clinicians who understand this stuff. If you're dealing with chronic pain, um, there's a lot that needs to be untangled and working with somebody who can evaluate your situation. Um, it is, I can imagine, I can only imagine how difficult it is to be an individual suffering from chronic pain who's seen so many different practitioners having so many narratives and stories. Um, but it really comes down to working with somebody who can help kind of untangle that stuff for you. 
And based upon the process, and that's really what a lot of my therapeutic process is about, is untangling that stuff and saying, well, you've been told this, you've been told this, but these, these narratives don't add up when we do things. You know, for example, um, all the muscle imbalance issues that people have told they, they've been told they've had or these structural issues. So you have to work with somebody to help you untangle that and to understand when it is appropriate and not appropriate to interpret pain in certain ways. Um, for me, as in, you know, for me, I'm a licensed, you know, massage therapist and clinical massage therapy and do movement work. I do generally do not push people through pain um, because that's not really my domain. And I, I don't want to teach people to just, you know, put their foot on the gas pedal and work through pain because it might teach you bad behaviors to ignore things. Um, I try to work around things to desensitize the nervous system so that they can safely start to move into positions and activities so that they don't feel threatened. Although, um, again, it depends on your, your scope of practice and the kind of work that you do as well, because I know a number of different clinicians who teach people to work into pain zones and to teach them how to desensitize themselves to it as well. So there's a lot of kind of variety here of different types of health practitioners and what they tend to do when they work with people in pain. Um, and we each have our preferences. And as long as I've been doing this, most of the time, I'd say, you know, there are certain circumstances where you might need to move through some pain, like when people have knee issues, it's very hard to give exercises that don't cause any sensitivity at all. So, you know, you have to kind of um, evaluate that based on the individual. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was great. Um, I don't know which audio, but it sounds like there's a bear in the background. Yeah, <laughs> It was like, no, it like that someone was, was in pain. <laughs> motorcycle outside. Oh, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> I thought you had a dog on the ground, like running or something. Uh, David, David, go ahead. <laughs> so, Sam, I'm I'm curious about this biopsychosocial approach you take with people with pain. So, so how do you approach this with people, and how do you work in that and that uh, mental emotional capacity when it, when it comes to these type of things? Well, first of all, I would say that when we're dealing with kind of like the aspect of, well, biopsychosocial for listeners, if they're not aware of this, I would say is just generally all of the factors that exist outside of kind of like the, the problem that seem to uh, provoke or sustain the problem. It kind of keeps it doing its thing. So for example, um, you know, let's say between a husband and a wife, let's say husband's back goes out and he's been having problems with his back for a long time. And, you know, he's, he's kind of acutely aware uh, always of thinking about his back. You know, one day the trash needs to be taken out and he's about to go take that out. Wife goes, no, 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 we'll deal with that. Your back is, is you got a bad back. And so you think about that, that's, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but when you take circumstances like that, and you have many, many different occurrences in someone's environment that always reminds the person of this problem that they have. It can uh, serve to remind them that they have less function. They have less ability to perform in the environments, especially around the household and to do things and to be a contributing member of the household of society or at work or whatever. Um, then that actually has an effect on the individual and it makes them more sensitive. Uh, it raises the alarm uh, or the alert mechanism, make the person more vigilant and it seems so so small, so insignificant, but cumulatively, all of these elements in, an, in an, uh, an environment can serve to increase the sensitivity of the individual and increase the, uh, the, the chronicity of their pain experience. So that is very complicated. And I think in this kind of world, depending on our scope, we spend so much of our time with our clients in the office, and we see them taken out of these contexts, and we work with them over here. But we, we cannot, unfortunately, always just like be a fly on the wall and see how their environment is actually working um, that provokes these or causes these pain experiences to come back. And frankly, I'm always amazed. I tell people, I, I'm a, I think it's a miracle it works at all, that we can take somebody out of the environment, we can do things, stick them back in the environment, and it still works. So when we work with that, this is kind of like the big challenge that we have in this field is how to uh, take our voice with them, you know, so that it's with them all the time. So in that regard, we can use um, gadgets, we can use self-care things. I send people on, I'm big on home exercise programs and doing high volume uh, corrective exercises throughout the day, kinesio tape. And I know it's not, you know, some people and the researchers don't like these things, but this is just another way of taking some kind of sensory input to kind of lock in what we've done in the office and let them go home with it. So now it's interacting with them in that environment as another way to throw a wrench in the wheel. 
This is also my interest in hypnotherapy. And even though the unfortunate stigma that's associated with hypnotherapy, there's tons and tons of research behind hypnotherapy uh, clinically doing extremely well, especially with individuals who have pain. And the research supports it based on what we know about pain neuroscience. And um, the idea is, is to be able to kind of tap into the subconscious, the way that people perform behaviors, uh, their beliefs, uh, and the way they respond to things in their environment and so forth, so that if we can start to impact those things, then that sticks with them when they leave the office and they will start to respond to those different triggers and stimuli in their environment auto magically. And that's the idea is to how, how many different ways can we impact this mechanism or this uh, thing that sustains that pain experience. So I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious, Ben. So you've gotten heavily into this neuroscience picture to approach and help your clients. I mean, this is the master system, right? And what truth have you found in that? Because because you started just basically, you know, starting at the muscles and the rehab portion, but in the bigger picture of finding healing with people with all these different issues with pain, are you finding more truth in addressing the brain and the nervous system more upstream to get the resolution? And then everything else kind of trickles down from that as far as a hierarchy is concerned? Yeah. When I first started this work, I mean, it was the obsess obsessiveness with the minutia, the small things about corrective exercise and how muscles were firing and all of this. And it brought me to a certain level of success. But when I came over here and I started studying and I knew all of this early on, I had been exposed to hypnotherapy for pain and all of these different things. And I know that people could get out of pain, alter behaviors and things would change with this, but it, nothing really glued it together until I looked at the pain neuroscience, because really what that's all about is saying, you know, you have information coming from the body. The brain has to interpret this. There's much like we talked about where you could have structural damage and you could have no pain. That haunts me. It haunts me in that when we, we work with people is that how do we change the brain's interpretation of this information? We can reduce the amount of pain or we can, sh we can shut it down by getting the brain to stop caring about that information and to start sending descending signals, anti nociception down to just block it out. And if that's possible, then we have to use an, a bottom up and a top down approach. And the top down approach starts with education. Um, people have to understand this. And I'd have to say it's by far and away the, been the most impactful thing that I've done with people is to take 15 minutes out of their first visit and do pain education with them and teach them what is pain because they have no idea. And I've had people, you know, I, I don't think I've ever once had somebody come in who's seen a pain doctor or a pain medicine expert or anybody along that lines who has ever explained pain to somebody. They have no idea. So my question is, is that when you've got two people talking at each other and the language is just flying right past each other, this experience is not matching this knowledge and nobody knows what's going on. And no wonder why people come in feeling frustrated and feel like they haven't been heard or listened to um, because nobody's listening and getting, sitting down with them and listening and absorbing that information, translating it into this is what's happening and this is what we're going to do about it is I find that most people is what they're craving and what by itself will lower that alarm system in the individual, lower that vigilance and already starts to reduce pain by, you know, by starting to take care of that process before we actually get into the, the movement work, before we get into the lifestyle changes or anything else. And I love that you're saying that. I mean, you've said so many amazing things today that, that I know people are going to reflect on and, and a couple of those that come to mind, uh, one, when you referred to, uh, you know, these individuals that, uh, that sort of have a memory of pain, because I find it fascinating that when the pain's not there, it's like you never knew it was there until it comes back. And so you, and you talked about the interpretation, the memory being another piece of this puzzle. But talk about that a little bit, because, you know, I, I imagine, I mean, I see this with the people that we work with as well, David and both of you guys, um, people forget that they had this pain and it's total amnesia. It's like, it's completely out of the registrar of uh, an ability to remember it. Not until you bring it up like, Hey, you remember that pain you had in your, you know, your left knee 
oh, oh yeah, like I guess that was a problem for a little while there. And so everything you're sharing on like these degenerative changes that do, you know, sometimes coincide with the pain response, but not always. I mean, I find it just fascinating, this whole memory side of the pain. I'd love, you know, maybe just add some content there on that piece. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the memory side is very interesting. You have some people that seem to delete things. I mean, everybody has you know, uh, pulls and sensations if they've ever done exercise work. But most of the time, people aren't even aware of the fact that they delete it. You know, they feel something in their body and they just move on from it. And then you have somebody who one time their back felt like tight and then they fixate on it where the brain remembers that one feeling and anything that feels like that, boom, causes that alarm to go right back up again. When somebody has had chronic, let's say back pain and every single time they feel that feeling, the brain goes, this is going to happen. Back's going to go out. Yeah. But yet in it's what's happening is to their, in their mind, a lot of times it's a 100% correlation between the feeling and the effect. And the problem with that statement is, is that it's not true because it's an overgeneralization. And those two things may be connected, but they may not be connected. So I'll ask people and they say, well, I feel that feeling in my back and the alarm goes up and now movement apprehension starts. So I tell those people, I say, how do you know your back's going to go out? Has it ever not gone out when you felt that feeling? And that person goes, well, yeah, I felt it before and my back hasn't gone out, but it's going to go out. And I go, are you <laughs> sure about that? Because what happens is a lot of times, let's talk about centralized pain where this happens. One of the absolute hallmark signs that somebody has centralized pain, central sensitization is that if you have them think about doing the movement that they're afraid to do, and they have pain without doing the movement, but by literally mentally rehearsing it, it's central sensitization because the movement didn't even occur. Now we do know that when somebody thinks about it, those neurons start to kind of activate and that person's body prepares itself for movement, but that should not happen. Okay. If that happens, then what has occurred is the story that the nervous system has created with all of those different components starts to trigger the alarm before the movement even occurs. So that's how powerful that can be. And so also why we would do in those situations, the therapy wouldn't necessarily be movement. You could do a graded exposure movement, but you can't even get them to move. So what you have to do is to mentally rehearse it, guided meditation, hypnotherapy, to put the person into a safe place, remind them that they're not actually doing the movement, and then mentally rehearsing it over and over again to do what? To reduce vigilance and to prepare the nervous system for safe movement. So these memories that people have and this kinesthetic memory that they have is just like anything else. We know, and I remind people that your memories are uh, like, for example, uh, witness accounts are notoriously wrong. And the reason why they're so uh, you know, questionable, even in a court of law. So, but you're so certain that when you feel something, that something's going to happen because it happened before. Well, that might not have all been how it actually occurred, but that's how your brain encoded it. And we need to start changing that. Or otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for us to change this, um, this issue that you have. Uh -huh. I mean, I can't help but think it's like, it's like we've hypnotized ourselves into dysfunction. You know, you, you mentioned before, like the guy, I got a bad back. I can't do that. Right. And it's just that repetition of like this hypnotic event. And I can see, you know, many uh, people in our clinic and, and just, you know, just hearing stories like this, where there's been such huge value in re-educating, reframing that pain, but then also getting into a, maybe a positive hypnotic uh, experience where you're helping to reinforce the you know, uh, the elimination or the, or the lack of need for this, you know, safety or this guarding that, that goes on emotionally, physically as well. Exactly. And that's where we get into, I think, uh, Dr. Um, Laura Moore Mosley's book, where he had the pain protectometer is what it was called. It. And the idea is to sending these things called sims and dims. A sim, S-I-M, is safety in me. Dim is danger in me. So when we're in pain, a lot of times we're sending dims, we're sending danger messages, the things I can't do, the things my life is limited by. So one of the fundamental aspects of setting goals is so important within pain because reducing pain should not be the primary goal of a pain relief program. I know that sounds bizarre, but the primary goal of a pain relief program should be uh, improving function. So when somebody's primary issue with pain isn't always the pain, when somebody's in severe pain, obviously that's the goal. And they're usually in the emergency room for that.
But with chronic pain, the primary problem for most people is what pain is stopping them from doing. So if I ask you, I say, look, if I, even if you're paid, say exactly the same, but I could get you back on the bike, I can get you back to running or playing volleyball, would you be better off? Would you be happy with that result? And they say, oh yeah, even if you had the same pain, yep. You know, so, and they don't really mean that because they also want to have less pain and do the activity, but it just goes to show you the hierarchy of the values. The problem is not the pain itself. The problem is the, is what it's stopping the person from doing. So when we set goals in the therapeutic process, it should be toward improving uh, their ability to do things. Well, Sam, um, you know, I started with you in three weeks ago. My pain is only slightly better. Okay. But you remember when you came in, you couldn't do a squat. Yeah. Well, you're doing squats with hundred pounds on your back now for sets of 10. Yeah. But the pain is, is not that much better. Okay. Your container is better. So now do squats with your body weight. Oh, well, it's better now. Okay. Wait a minute. So you can do a squat with your body weight, right? You could do squats hundred pounds for 10 reps. The pain is there. But then when I take the bar off your back, you could do body weight squats for 30 with no pain. Do you see the improvement? Okay. So we have to constantly be reminding the brain to stop fixating on the pain because it makes us sensitized to it. Um, the best metaphor I can give you is I tell people, when you buy a new car, you see your car everywhere, don't you? Um, and because we have a component of the brain, we have a mechanism that raises a level of importance to things that we see as important and we become sensitized to it. When our senses pick it up, we pay attention to it right away. The problem with pain is the importance that we put on it, the, the value and the beliefs that we have around it. We have become sensitized to it. We pay attention to it all the time, which the problem with that is it makes us more sensitive to it. So we have to, in a way, start paying attention to it so that we can learn what it's all about, but then to move ourselves to paying attention to functional improvements, how we're moving toward our goals. I get one more repetition. I could cycle a half more mile. All of those little things is sending SIM information to our nervous systems, safety in me, and it's changing the way the brain is responding to the pain experience. Beautifully said, man. That was awesome. So Sam, we're, we're wrapping up here, so, and, I, and I really do want to talk about your book. So the book's called Why Didn't My Doctor Tell Me That? What You Need to Know to Get Your Life Back from <laughs> Chronic Pain. So real quick, can you just kind of share with our listeners, just give us a, an idea of like what made you want to write this book and what it's all encompassing and, and what they're going to get out of, of looking into something like this? Well, I started out this actually as a digital document that I wanted to keep upgrading to say where people go you know, uh, I don't know if I believe what you're telling me. And I'm like, you know what, there's research on this. So I went out and I pulled together all the research and that led me toward this rabbit hole where there was a lot of stuff out there that I didn't even know. Um, so in particular, one of the things that really spawned my interest was sleep. And actually the number one thing that improves uh, someone's coping with uh, and, and reduces sensitivity to pain is improved sleep. And then there's this obvious glaring uh, contradiction here where sleep is so important but yet the research on when I was looking at caffeine, because I kept arguing that caffeine makes pain worse. The research doesn't say that. The research says that pain is positively impacted by caffeine intake. But then the problem here is, is that the, the difference between caffeine and sleep. So it, one messes the other up, but nobody talks about it. And I'm like, okay, what else is in here that's been missing? And I kind of went on this fact finding hunt. And anyway, the story is I just kind of put it together in chapters in my book and wrote chapters on what the research says about uh, different elements of chronic pain, uh, MRI studies, corrective exercise, posture, all the things out there that people are always talking about and bringing some truth to this, saying what the research says. Um, obviously, every single person has their bias. I'm a massage and a movement guy. So you'll see some of that stuff in there, but you'll find some surprising stuff. And it's just, it's complicated and there's a lot of things out there. But what I really wanted to write it for is to teach people that, hey, if you think that you've gone through everything and you've tried everything, no, you're missing a lot. You know, no practitioner, single practitioner can put all of this together. Uh, we're all trying to do it and to try to like, you know, really figure out what's the best thing for each person and hit the nail on the head without turning their life upside down overnight with, with all these nutritional changes and lifestyle stuff. But, you know, there's a lot out there and where there's so much that's been untapped for the individual. And um, that's kind of the direction I wanted to go with the book. I didn't want to sell it. So I give it away for free because it's a living document that I'm going to continue upgrading and um, helping to educate people on how to get themselves out of chronic pain. 
It's amazing what you're doing, man. And you've done such a good job of painting a picture today to show people these gaps or how they need to look outside the box of their thinking, you know, and kind of look at these other things. Cause you know, I think the, for the, a lot of the general population that doesn't know what we know as doctors and practitioners and what, cause we live in it. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're just, they're just so aloof. Right. And so it's like, you're saying, it's just this focus of pain and get me out of pain. And it must be this simple because this is this, and this is that. And it's just so much more complicated than that. I so. saw it on Instagram. You just need to <laughs> stretch. You got to stretch my psoas. That's all my problems. And I'm like, <laughs> If you could do a, a if now. you could do a psoas stretch and that's the end of your pain, I you probably didn't have that much of a problem to begin with, right? Yeah. There's some people out there with some with with some real issues. Yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> My hats off to you, man. You're doing amazing work. I would Thank love you. to have you on the podcast again in the future. Your wealth of knowledge and wisdom and information, and it, we really enjoyed chatting with you today, man. Absolutely. Yeah, Loved it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Sam, you, one, one last thing we always like to get uh, our, our guests to share, you know, maybe what are, what's one thing they can, one or two things maybe they can put into practice just from the knowledge that you shared today. Most important thing I would say, learn about pain. Um, you know, go into Google, go into YouTube, look up pain neuroscience education. There's some fun little videos that people can go on there. And it's such a profound thing and it'll open up a whole window of, of awareness. I mean, obviously you read my book, it'll, it'll give you a lot of ideas and information out there, but uh, start to educate yourself so that you're an at your own advocate on these things. Um, Cause not everybody has access to practitioners like us who know this stuff. You know, you might have to just kind of know this stuff, walk into the doctor's office and start asking questions. Um, but that's probably the best thing that you can do is to be an advocate for your care because uh, not everybody knows this stuff. So I would say that number one, doing, doing your homework on that. And the other thing is, is just doing your best on finding out actual resources and strategies to do certain things. Um, I think that, for example, uh, we're always looking at decreased stress. You know, I hate that recommendation. The question is, you know, look up online, how do I specifically reduce stress? You know, how do I, and start to become somebody who chases down individual strategies and, um, you know, a lot of digging in and just doing the work. Don't sit back on your heels, you know, and, and wait for somebody else to do the work for you. Yeah. It, I mean, so, so many nuggets. And, and I love how the focus was really about always improving functionality. And, and, you know, I find it just fascinating that often in order to take, take steps forward in our healing, it's that we have to, you know, dismantle the programming of everything that we th feel like we've known to be true for ourselves. And, and that, that awakening process is just so important. And I'd say, you know, going back to the point you made on the doctor, you got to shadow a lot of uh, what happened with with the people was that they got to be in the presence of someone who who's dug into that truth and dug into the the reality of what it means to to get healthy and to be uh, a mirror for people and and so thank you for doing that in, in a Ab big big way absolutely and the last word i would say about that doctor is that he would not let you take things seriously so <laughs> uh, just put that in that's a whole nother topic to go through but um wow just changing yeah. the experience and, and, and stopping people from being so serious because seriousness yeah. is indeed a disease that is undiagnosed these days. Yeah. That's a whole nother podcast topic right there. Love it. it absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sam, Sam, real quick, where can yep. people find your stuff, man? If people are looking for your info. Uh, we'll probably drop a link there in the in the show show notes, yeah. but releasemusclotherapy.com um, awesome. on the homepage. When you scroll down, you can grab a copy of my book. I have a free membership area that has lots of resources, and I just stick all my new stuff in there. So it's you know it's a smorgasbord of great stuff. Uh, I'm very active on Instagram these days, so release muscle therapy is the handle. Uh, I do post a lot of movement mechanical stuff. People seem to like that on Instagram, awesome. uh, but those are the two areas to pretty much catch up with me and, and YouTube some of my real long content. Um, so that's a good format for that. But those are the great places to catch up with me. Perfect. Thank Amazing. you again, Sam. Appreciate thanks, you, Sam. Man. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to The Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.